Well, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Good morning to you all. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this difficult and necessary conversation. Throughout this program, you may hear words and see pictures that disturb you. Students, you may want to watch and participate with a trusted adult. But enough from me, Chester's Children's Chorus has a message for you. Please listen, really hear them. One, two, three,
My name is Tamia Scipio Smith. I am the Education Policy Director at PCCY, Public Citizens for Children and Youth. We thank Chester Children's Chorus for sharing our message with you. We welcome you to our teen town hall on race. Today, we are talking with young people about race and racism, a conversation that is often so painful that adults can't talk about it. George Floyd's death has forced us to start talking and take a good hard look at justice, fairness, and the impact race has on whether or not we are treated fairly or justly. From the outrage, demonstrations, protests, reanimated fears, and tears, it is clear that we have not liked what we've seen. People all over the world are saying that we, as a society, will not tolerate racism. We cannot perpetuate injustice. Enough is indeed enough. Our children have been watching, processing, and leading, and today they are weighing in. In this space, we as an audience will celebrate these young people for being courageous enough to speak up about their experiences being bold enough to ask questions and for taking action. We will not tolerate messages of hate. And we know that those of you who have chosen to join us will respect and support our youth as they bravely and honestly have a conversation about race and the reality of racism in America. I now turn the program over to Lorraine Ballard Murill to get started with our children and our questions. Thank you, Tamia. I am so honored to be a part of this event today. I didn't expect to begin today crying, so thank you for that. <laughs> that was very moving from the Chester Children's Choir and simply another reminder of why we're here today. I think uh, as many of us experienced on Saturday, seeing so many young people marching 100,000 strong we are now empowered to know how youth are really moving this movement. And today we're going to have an opportunity for young people to have this conversation with some wonderful adult allies. We invite you who are on this uh, Zoom call to uh, submit your questions uh, du during the chat or in the chat box. So please do feel free to be a very much a part of this conversation. So we're gonna kick it off with a question from a student, Christian H. from Drexel Hill Middle School. And this question is directed to Senator Bob Casey. Senator Bob Casey, the question is, what can I as an individual do to spread awareness on this issue? I hope you can hear me and if you, uh, someone will tell me if you can't, uh, obviously, but thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank Christian for the question. And uh, I think the answer is um, is not going to be uh, uh, an answer that uh, a lot of the, the young people who just gave us that, that great um, uh, hymn and, and also were uh, have been part of this discussion today and will be part of the discussion. This isn't something you don't know already, but let me just give you my sense of it. We have a, a moment here in American history that we're living through that is unlike any moment of its kind, at least in the last 50 years, I think. And it's a moral moment. It's not just the passing of a couple of days or weeks or months. This is a moral moment. And each of you is part of this. And each of you can contribute to it. And I know many of the children, many of the students on this uh, in this meeting today have, have already contributed. The first thing I'd say is that you've already inspired us, adults, uh, to take action, to not just lament that our criminal justice system is infused with racism, not just to lament that our policing practices do not measure up to our constitution and our values. It's not enough to lament that and to uh, uh, to kind of curse 
uh, the darkness. We have to act. And that and when you're a legislator like me or like any of the other legislators on this call, acting means legislating. It doesn't mean speech, you know, just giving speeches and and um, talking about something. It means acting the way of, acting by way of legislation. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure that um, we give you something to to work with us on, and that's legislation. There's a bill in both the House and the Senate, the Justice in Policing Act, which many of you might know about. Um, in the in the House, for example, it's HR that stands for House Resolution 7120, uh, and we have a similar bill, uh, the exact same bill, virtually in the Senate. But we hope that you can you can uh, get a sense of what that bill will in, entail and all of the, the ways that it brings about uh, a better policing system throughout the country, whether it's more uh, more accountability for police, whether it's more transparency in what happens in encounters between the police and, and citizens, and, and a whole host of other uh, provisions in those bills. So the best thing that you can help us with in terms of policy would be to learn about parts of that bill and talk about it. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, uh, talk to neighbors, but maybe especially talking to folks that you're close to, uh, your your close friends, the, the people you go to school with, or friends of friends, and even even family members who may not think about these issues on a regular basis. Secondly, I would say that you're never too young to bring about change. Our country is full of history where major changes happened because young people got involved. And not simply uh, young people who are legislators or who are in government, but literally uh, much younger people. Sometimes grade school, grade school students have had an impact on American history and, and policy. Sometimes high school students. When, when I think about um, someone that a lot of the members of Congress, uh, someone whom a lot of the members of Congress know, John Lewis, when he was marching in, for racial justice in the early 1960s, uh, he was very young. He was starting as a teenager. And when he was a leader in that movement, a leader in the civil rights movement, uh, really throughout the South, uh, John Lewis was uh, only about 20 or 21 years old. And uh, he was he was beaten uh, because of what he what he was standing for, and he never gave up on uh, justice, and he never gave up on um, peaceful, nonviolent efforts to bring about justice. So you can never be too young to bring about change. You have to start with those around you. And I, the other thing I would say is try to make the focus on what that change will mean for the person that you're talking to, uh, why their lives will be better as well. We know that when, when we have more racial justice and more equal justice, we're all better off. All of our lives are better. Our country is diminished and our country is hurt by efforts that um, do not result in, in, um, in, in more justice. I think we all have to be drawn upon uh, have to draw upon inspiration for those like John Lewis or, or others that you know from even the last couple of weeks, young people who led marches, young people who are marching, young people who uh, put themselves at risk to bring, uh, bring about greater accountability and greater justice. You know what Martin Luther King said a long time ago about being uh, about being patient, but also being determined to bring about justice. He said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think that message is going to be very important. We're going to, this is not going to take days, weeks, and months. This is going to take longer. We have to be ready for a long, tough road. But I think the young people that are gathered today understand that, and your lives are going to be uh, better than the lives of those who have gone before you because of what you do, what you do as as activists, what you do as advocates for uh, for for a better justice system. And we've got to draw upon inspiration. And one of the inspirations for me is to watch what you are doing already. So I want to commend and salute what you've already done 
and I want to commend you for what I know you will do in, in throughout southeastern Pennsylvania, and I know many of you will go on to be national leaders uh, helping to improve our justice system. God bless your work. Thank you so much, U.S. Senator Bob Casey. Uh, Bob Casey had to leave uh, for uh, other responsibilities, so we put him first, but we are going to be hearing from some of our amazing young people. Before I introduce them, let me just uh, note who is here with us today. Some of you are already here. Some will be joining us shortly. Among our federal legislators, we have Congresswoman Madeline Dean, Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon, Congressman Dwight Evans, and staff from Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick's office. Among our state legislators, we have Senator Maria Collette, Senator Art Haywood, Senator Tim Carney. We have Senator Katie Muth, Senator Steve Santacero, Senator Tommy Tomlinson, Representative Matt Bradford, Representative Tim Briggs, Representative Donna Bullock, Representative Carol Kamita, Representative Mary Jo Daly, Representative Pam DeLisso, Representative Jordan Harris, Representative Christine Howard, Representative Mary Isaacson, Representative Leanne Kruger, Representative Jennifer O'Mara, Representative Daniel Friel Auten, and Representative Wendy Allman, Representative Perry Warren and Representative Michael Zabel. Among our student speakers, we have Kayla Kochi from Ridley High School, Krama Manseley from Academy Park High School, Cremo rather, Michelle Waxman from Pensbury High School, Seif Ghazi from Radnor High School, Harry Cotter from Ridley High School. So let's begin by talking to some of these amazing young people. So let's start with you, Kayla. Can you tell us uh, some, look, tell us your story. Tell us your story as it relates to this larger discussion about race. I am a product of the love that we lack in today's society. Um, my skin color is the outcome of the unity between white and black love. And I have also been put in an awful position by my own brothers and sisters. I watched Mortified with a reminder that my black brother could be Trayvon Martin. I cried with tears of frustration that my white grandparents, who have raised me, stare at their own race with anger and with fear of the evil that they could do to women and men who look like their granddaughter and grandson. My skin is one color, but my heart is divided because of society. For years, biracial people have been seen as taboo. They have been shunned by one group or another. But I hope my skin and my voice can remind people of the unity that is needed between races, the education that is needed on both sides. Since the day I have been born, I have been an example to people in my life as a Black woman. They have seen through my pain and my triumphs what life is like for a person of color. And though the majority of my family and friends and teachers are white and they can never fully understand what my brother and I go through, they can catch a glimpse. And that glimpse has been enough for them to reach out, to ask questions, to take actions, to educate themselves, and further to be a Black ally. That is what is needed. <sighs> Unity, education, conversations. Not many people in my life know what it is like for a woman of color to live her life or what a man of color goes through, but being a part of their life has allowed them to observe. This starts locally, this starts in our close family, in our distant relatives, in our friends, in our teachers. Many of the white people in our lives don't see color. But we need to sit down with them and have the conversations with them about color. We are not just students. We are Black students. We are not just friends. We are Black friends. We are not just family. We are Black family. And they can learn through our eyes and voices, so please have those conversations. I have taken the initiative to organize a virtual forum where students can have those conversations with their teachers and community leaders. Protests are controversial in our community, even though they shouldn't be, as this country has been built on protests. The biggest example being the Boston Tea Party. Many schools will turn their heads at protests and many leaders in office will do the same. So let's level, let's educate, let's discuss the voices and the people behind the protests. Let's have the conversations as to why people are protesting. And then maybe one day more leaders in schools will one day be out on the streets with us and be educating themselves more about their black students and black constituents. My questions for the leaders in schools in our community is, how can you glorify protests that shape this country's history, but not stand with your Black community as they protest for racial justice? Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Kayla. Let's go to Kramo Mansale. Share your story. 
All right. Hello? We got gotcha. you. All right. Good morning, legislators. My name is Karamo Masale, and I'd like to share a bit of my experience with race and racism in America. As a scholarly Black African Muslim male in a low socioeconomic status who is the son of two immigrants, self-advocacy and intersectionality are two major parts of my identity. The first thing that many people identify others by is the color of their skin, and the color of mine just so happens to be Black. From the day Black Africans were brought to the shores of America to provide free labor for the people that stole them from their homes until today in which Black people need to be activists for their own human rights because of systemic racism and systematic oppression that we face in this country due to society not being built for our prosperity, Black people have been failed by this government that promises us equality and fair treatment time and time again. The recent examples of police brutality disproportionately affecting Black people is a prime and current example of this failure. Because of my knowledge of these things and it affected me so closely because, as Kayla said, her brother could be Trayvon Martin, but I could be George Floyd. And that's a reality that we all live with as people of color and as black people specifically. Knowing this has motivated me to organize and advocate for causes such as this. Because when I know that being black is criminalized in America, I will have to see change because that shouldn't be the reality. And if I wanna see that change in the world, I have to be that change in the world. That starts with me getting involved in my community with cleanups. It also happens with me hosting public information sessions regarding black history and attending protests and signing uh, petitions. When this heightened awareness comes together, it gives me more of a sense of this is how the world is and this is what my contribution can be. I just wanna make sure that when you know the history books are written, I'm on the right side of that. And the right side of that is making sure that people can be comfortable and feel equal and have justice in the world. And that's my story regarding race and racism in America. All right, thank you so much, Cremo. Let's go to Michelle Waxman from Pensbury High School. Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am an American Jew, and I'm surrounded by a really strong Jewish family and larger Jewish community. Um, and both members of both of these groups are often very quick to call out things like anti-Semitism. Um, like, you know, the whole Facebook and all of a sudden their Facebook profiles are changed to, you know, we stand united, but they often turn a blind eye to other forms of hate, prejudice, bigotry, and racism. Sometimes they unfortunately contribute to these problems. So I often find myself in conversations with my family and other members of my community trying to show them how their words and actions are actually racist. And that if someone said that about you know, something equivalent about a Jewish person, they'd be angry and expect change. So their double standards are really um, glaringly abhorrent. And what I tried to convey is that in their outrage from anti-Semitism looking for an ally, but when other um, acts of hatred happen, they're not that ally for someone else who needs it. And there, there's also even further double standards um, we've seen in our communities, um, racist comments towards Jews of color and American Jewry is unfortunately, as many other things in America are depressingly white. And I think there's a, you know, there's a really, there's a lack of acknowledgement of Jews of color. So. A lot of times I find myself in these conversations about, um, you know, how they're actually contributing to a problem. And as a, someone who benefits from my privilege, I'm really thankful to be here today to be able to listen to everyone's experiences and try to educate myself. And, you know, right now I'm trying my best to be involved in these kind of conversations um, and I've been voting and um, things like that I voted for the first time on June 2nd, which was exciting. Um, but yeah, thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Michelle. Let's go to Sif Ghazi, Sif from Radnor High School. Sif, are you there? Sorry, everybody, I was, I was muted. So I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, my story is a story of microaggressions that I think a lot of people with, who share my complexion have faced in this nation. Uh, during my sophomore year, uh, my, my math teacher, I later found out, assumed I was Indian. So in the second half of the year when she created a new seating chart, she seated me next to the only other Indian person in class or the only other brown person in class. And throughout that quarter, she repeatedly made remarks about how we were um, kept like making jokes about how we were flirting or how she even went as far as to say that we would look in front of the entire class, that we would look really good together as a couple. And she continued making these remarks, even though she saw that every time she made them, we were uh, very uncomfortable with that rhetoric. And, uh, that, and that entire series of events made me feel very self-conscious about my skin color. And it really made me uh, take a look at how, I guess it made me realize how different I was from my other classmates who were all white. Not in like a, I, I wasn't like, I don't think the intention was to make me feel single out, 
but it definitely made me feel sort of like isolated and different from the rest of my group. Okay, thank you, Seif. And Harry Cotter from Ridley High School. Harry? Hello. Um, so racial equity and justice is one of my community's weaknesses. Black students make up a sizable segment of my school student body, but I don't believe there has been more than three black teachers at my school in the time that I've been there. I've had only one non-white teacher in high school. When I was an underclassman, one of our assistant principals was a black man, and the way he was able to connect with black students at my school showed me just how important it is to have a teaching staff that's representative of the student body. As a white man, other white people often feel comfortable making racist remarks around me. So I've heard adults use the N-word and refer to black people with coded language like people from the city, renters, and in light of recent events, rioters. I've watched my peers directly call black people the N-word and shout black people are smelly. I have very rarely seen students get punished for racism. I've heard from a source within my community's police department that all prospective officers applying to that police department must know someone already working in the department. Also, an unofficial check is done to make sure that the applicant's voting record satisfies the department's leaders. These conditions lead to an incredible degree of whiteness in the police force, a very insular environment for police officers, and a total disconnect between law enforcement and vulnerable communities of color. I believe that many of my peers succumb to racist ideas because so many adults and institutions around them demonstrate and reinforce those ideas. Racism isn't only systematic, it's generational. Representation and stronger, more thorough education on racial issues is essential. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you all for sharing your story. Um, these are important messages and very powerful stories. And now what we'd like to do is introduce a panel of adults. And what I'd like to do is to introduce, uh, beginning with State Representative Jordan Harris. Jordan Harris is a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and has represented the 186th legislative district since 2013. Representative Harris currently serves as the Democratic Caucus Whip he has previously served as chairman of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. Montgomery County Commissioner Val Arkush is the chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. She leads a three-member board of commissioners and is committed to improving services for children, veterans, and seniors while ensuring an effective, transparent, and fiscally responsible government. And Dr. Tawana Jones-Morrison is an educator for over 20 years, currently a school psychologist, community educator and professional development leader. She is the founder and executive director of We Rain Inc., a Philadelphia-based nonprofit organization that centers on lived experiences of black girls. And so um, let's go to uh, the kids and uh, ask uh, them to ask the question. So I'm gonna go with Gabe P.A. from East Norton, Middle school. Gabe, can you uh, go ahead and ask your question? Um, hello, my name is Gabe PA, and I'm 13 years old, and I attend Nashtown Area School District. I watched the video of George Floyd being killed by the cops. It disturbed me because he's. It disturbed me because he said he couldn't breathe, and they didn't get off of him. My question is: Why are police officers killing unarmed black men? and getting away with it. All right, this is a question for any of our panelists. Let's try State Representative Jordan Harris. Would you like to jump in? Uh, sure, uh, first, uh, what's up Gabe? Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, question. Um, the fact is um, that the way our laws are set up, um, there's, a lack of a lack of disciplinary actions that can be taken in a lot of these things, uh, whether it's the fact that when we do our collective bargaining, meaning when our our, our you know departments get together with the unions and, and they agree on things, um, things in the disciplinary code um, um, don't adequately address this. 
Um, so we need to uh, change the way we do our laws in Pennsylvania to actually address uh, use of force, which is um, the amount of, of force a person can apply um, when they're trying to arrest a person. We also need to address the types of force that a person can use when they're trying to arrest a person. For example, using a chokehold on a person when they're trying to arrest them. Um, so we need to address those things when we talk about how police officers are engaging um, and when they're making arrests. I hope that answers uh, a part of your question. Thank you. Did uh, Dr. Akush or Dr. Morrison have anything that they wanted to add? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Hey, Gabe, it's nice to meet you. Thanks so much for your question. Um, I agree with everything that Representative Harris said, and I would add that uh, we need better training of our police, and particularly in Montgomery County, where, where Gabe and I both live, there are very few police officers of color. And one of the things that I hope that we can do a better job of going forward is helping um, or understanding what the barriers are and, and how we can remove some of those barriers so that we can get, a, uh, we have 50 police departments in Montgomery County, how we can ensure that the 50 police departments actually look like the communities that they're sworn to protect. And I think there's also some really bigger picture things. I think there's a just inherent structural racism and bias that so many white people carry around and uh, that can translate into having a much more aggressive response to a person of color than a white person uh, by the police. And there's other steps that I think we can take that some of which we've done in Montgomery County, which is that we have 24-7 uh, a team that can go out and respond to a mental health emergency, a mobile crisis team so that the police don't have to become involved in that. And we also have a 24-7 street outreach team that can respond to anyone who appears to be experiencing homelessness. And those teams are prepared and trained to de-escalate and work with individuals who are not criminals. They just need some help. And so we hope that by doing some of those things, uh, we can make it um, um, eliminate what you're, what you're talking about, which is just brutal violence to particularly uh, black men who are almost always unarmed. So thank you for your question. All right. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Morrison, did you wanna jump in as well? Sure, thank you so much for your question, Gabe. I was, I'm going to um, just add on to what was already said um, by the commissioner and Representative Harris and say that the training is really critical. And what we wanna do as a community is also understand what our police officers are experiencing when they go into our communities so that we can understand how to support them in the work that they do and ensure that their mental health as well and that they are prepared to be in the communities and working with us to protect and serve and not to harm. All right, let's go to uh, one of our students, Leanna Yancey from Central High School. Uh, Leanna was also a panelist on our Power 99 WDAS Town Hall on Race and Reform and uh, very articulate. So you have a question for Representative Harris. Yes, um, good morning. My question today is, what are the foreseeable actions that are being taken for the youth in the school systems? Let's talk about defunding the police department. Would that money be allocated into restorative justice practices in schools? as opposed to the school to prison pipeline. What's going on? Good to see you again. Um, uh, so so the, the fund the police for, uh, 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 movement and what folks are saying, I think we need to have a greater understanding of what that means. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily just about, you know, uh, firing police officers or disbanding um, police department, but, but what it is is around how do we change how we use police in, in our commonwealth? For example, um, and a friend of mine used this example, and I think it's a perfect example. Like in Philadelphia, in order to block off your street for a block party, um, you, you have to go to the, the streets department and whatnot to get a permit. Well, when you want to enforce that, 
we call the police. Why, why are we calling the police? Why are we not calling the streets department? Like, we've just been trained to like, whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's an issue, whenever there's anything going on, that the first thing you do is you pick up the phone and you call the police. A contractor is doing something on your block. They left, you know, you know uh, wood or bricks or whatever in the middle of the street. The first thing you do, you pick up the phone and you call the police. Well, when you do that, what we're, what, we're, what we're doing is we're increasing the kind of police contact that we're having in our community without really talking about what type of things we should actually be calling the police for. So with regard to our schools, I'm one that believes um, that we don't need more armed police officers in schools, right? What we need is we need more social workers in our schools. We need more um, in my view, more folks who live in our communities to be in our schools, um, helping our young people work through things. What we cannot do is we cannot criminalize childhood activities and childhood behavior. When I was in school, you got into a fight, you got sent to the principal's office, the principal sat there, they worked with you, they found out what was the issue, you talked through it, and they sent you back to class. Now, you get in a fight in school, somebody can leave in handcuffs. So, you know, we have to change. So when we talk about defunding, we, 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 should, also, we should also say um, kind of reworking and retooling what we're using our police officer for. Somebody gets shot, yes, call the police. Somebody's breaking into your home, call the police. But for many of the things that we call the police for, we shouldn't be. And we've trained ourselves to do that. So we have to uh, change how we do all those things. I would love to see more of the resources that we spend on police going into diversionary programs. I would love to see money that we're spending on police go into summer activities for young people. I would love to see more PAL centers. I would love to see more positive interactions and positive activities for our young people instead of us spending all of our resources on negative activities. We spend a, way, a whole lot of money on policing we don't spend a whole lot of money on what are those things that we can do on the front end to ensure that folks don't have to deal with the police in the first place. Hope that answers your question. All right. Thank you so much. Let's go to Alex uh, Bamford from North Penn High School, who has a question for Commissioner Arkush. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexis Bamford. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, my question for Commissioner Arkush is, what is the most common type of pushback or opposition you encounter when trying to implement changes related to cultural sensitivity or diversity, and how do you overcome them? Well, thanks, Alexis, for your question. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who aren't familiar with North Penn High School, it's the biggest high school in Montgomery County, and it's one of the most diverse and has been a real leader in our community in promoting diversity. Uh, every year they host the International Spring Festival, which is a celebration of multiple different cultures and draws 7,000, 8,000 people to North Penn High School for the day. So thank you. It's great to see you here. So from <clears throat> my perspective, um, I think what I hear most are people who are afraid. They don't say they're afraid, but the kinds of things that they talk about when faced with having to be more culturally sensitive or be more open or empathetic to people who don't look like them or maybe have a different cultural or ethnic background from them, it, it's all stuff that comes out of fear. And uh, sometimes that fear is based in racism. Sometimes that fear is based in worry that they're gonna lose some kind of power or control that they believe that they currently have. Um, sometimes it's just ignorance. And frankly, sometimes that ignorance is willful, meaning that they don't even wanna to try to understand somebody else's viewpoint. So it's a whole constellation of those things. And you can see it play out at a school board meeting or that type of thing where a school might be trying to implement a certain change that would uh, be more respectful of the diversity or the makeup of the student body. And then you might get a whole bunch of parents who look a certain way who are there opposing it uh, for reasons that really, if you, if you kind of pick them apart, don't make a whole lot of sense. 
um, it, it's a big culture shift for some people to just try to stand in somebody else's shoes and be empathetic and imagine what that other person might feel like. And I think those are the things that we have to really promote because there is no question that our communities are so much stronger because of our diversity. And we just have to keep promoting that and standing up for it and defending it. All right, great. Thank you so much. And this next question is for Dr. Jones Morrison uh, from Veronica Botera from Abington High School. Veronica. Hi, can everyone hear me? I, yes, we can uh, hello. hear you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Veronica Botera, and I'm a rising junior at Abington Senior High School. Okay, we're we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Something that has had a negative impact on my life because of my Hispanic heritage. How can we implement a program? Okay, I think we had a little difficulty hearing that. Sorry, question. can you hear me now? Um. Okay. Can try try it again. Try the question one more time. Let's see if we can. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. My name is Veronica Botero. And I am a rising junior at Abington Senior High School. Well, I tell you what, I know what your question is. So how about if I help you out here? Something that has had a negative impact on my life. Okay, Veronica, how about this? The question is, how can schools implement a program in which implicit bias is addressed? Dr. Morrison? That is a great question, Veronica. And um, I know that this is something that is really reared, uh, come, come alive in this uh, time that we're in right now. And I want, to, I want first to say that implicit bias training is not a one-time training where you go for a few hours and you figure things out and you move on. What we really can be doing in schools is really helping our teachers and all people who come into the building to work with our students to really practice self-reflection first and understand who they are and how that their identities have developed because then that can help to shape how our conversations about students and the conversations that we have with students go. And the reason why that is important is because our interactions with students help to shape their own positive identity developments. And um, creating safe spaces for students where they know that they can go and talk to someone if, they're, if they feel that they've been discriminated against or they feel if someone has demonstrated bias against them is really important in terms of understanding implicit bias because we all can't know the things that we don't like if we've never been in those experiences or had those experiences. So schools need to do the work of really building authentic relationships with families and students and the community so that they can have ongoing dialogue about what is important to the community and the families and the students, not just what is important to the school, which is often academics and testing, but we also wanna make sure that we are creating safe racial spaces for our students, safe gender spaces for our students. And finally, disaggregating your data. Oftentimes we'll assume that if a school is predominantly white or predominantly black, that everything is okay, right? And what we really need to do is break down our data and see what students are being impacted by the systemic oppressions of school and the implicit biases that we bring with us and unpacking all of those things together. So before we think about doing something to the children, we wanna spend a lot of time working on ourselves as a staff and as individuals so that we're in the best position to support. Thank you so much. We uh, thank you all on this panel for joining us and for the students who asked those questions. And now we're gonna move on to a second set of panelists. And let me introduce them because uh, these young people will have an opportunity to interact with some of our Congress members. Joining us right now are Congressman Dwight Evans, 
We also have uh, Congresswoman Madeline Dean and Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon. And let me find my place here. And uh, so um, right now we want to uh, hear from Shannon Walsh from Creffield School. Shannon, are you there? All right. Well, I tell you what, I don't know if they're there or not, um, or whether my computer is uh, buffering. But uh, in any case, um, Shannon Walsh from Creffield School had the question, which is, what are you able to do in Congress to end systematic racism? Let's start with Congressman Dwight Evans. I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Now you are. You are unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, Lorraine. It's a pleasure. And I want to thank PCCY for conducting this kind of dialogue and discussion. It is long overdue, and especially with the audiences that we're talking to. I'm not talking to people like me. I'm talking to people behind me. You know, the most exciting thing, when I went to Washington, the delegation in Pennsylvania, when I got elected in 2016, was 13 to 5. It was 13 to 5. I was the only African American. And it's 18 members of Congress from Pennsylvania. I was the only African American. There's only been five African Americans. The first one was Robert N.C. Nix from this district in 1958. What changed drastically, and two of my buddies are on here, is Madeline Dean and Mary Gay Scanlon. Having the two of them where the delegation now is four women, and unfortunately, I'm still the only African-American. So when you talk about that, the first thing I think is very important when you talk about going to Congress is getting to know people who are not like you. It's not something that you pass in a piece of legislation because that is not the magic answer. In my view, that's, you can pass laws. We've had laws about anti-discrimination, all that, and you need all that. You know not to discriminate against somebody who looks something different than you, somebody who may be black, somebody who's Asian, somebody who's Latino, somebody who's from the LBGTQ community. That, those kind of policies. That happened a great deal when Lyndon Johnson was president and Martin Luther King. That happened. So here we are today. This delegation, in my view, and, and, and I don't say it because they're on the red, you have two of the smartest people who happen to be women, who, who are very straightforward, who speak their own mind, who don't have to be convinced about the element of the way that this world is. And I think that's very important. So when you say, when I went to Congress at first thing, first thing was changing the, changing the, the dynamics. I mean, change, there's four women now, uh, that, that, that changed first. Secondly, when we talk about policies, and I always say this, uh, particularly to Madeline Dean, when she said something, and I put like, when you have other than, see, I tell people other than African Americans raising issues, like I heard Val of Coos, see, you need other people to raise challenges about racial discrimination other than African Americans. It can't be that all of a sudden only African Americans see it that way. It has to be others who see it that way. And African Americans talking to African Americans is fine, but the reality of it is. How do others see the situation that they are involved in? So the second part of it is, is that person someone who is, as they use the phrase, stay woke? Is that person woke about what is happening in the world today? And if that person is not woke, then you can educate them. You can educate them. 
because it is the subtleties that exist in a situation that nine times out of 10 people don't pay attention. So there's obviously, the last piece is legislation. And in my view, we've changed policies such as health disparities. You've seen with the pandemic, you've seen with the unrest, the ones who are susceptible. The other issue I would throw in there, besides racial, is economics. Because you must talk about when there's the distribution of economics. Nine times out of 10, people who have money are gonna be associated with people who have money. I don't care if they're black or white, they're gonna be around with who they feel comfortable with. So the element of first, the representation you have, which is very important, right? And is that web representation someone who stay woke? Because they could be people you have representation and they still have no clue. You can have somebody who look like you and still have no clue that they don't understand what's going on. So don't make the assumption that because someone looks like you, they understand about inclusion. They don't necessarily have to understand that. So it's those kinds of things that I say, since I've been in Congress, it'll be four years this year, but, but, but I say with you, with, with the people I've seen around me thus far, and I wouldn't say that, I'm gonna be frank. I wouldn't say that about anybody, I'm gonna be frank. I, I, I watched Mary Gay Scanlon up front person, and I watched Madeline Dean. And I don't say, I don't say anything, just, look, their life experiences, in my view, have made them the kind of people who understand what it is about being aware of what's going on. I hope I answered your question. You sure did. Okay. Well, you know, I think what's so encouraging about everything that's happened over these last couple of weeks is the diversity of the people who've stepped out and, uh, and spoken out during these protests. Again, uh, that protest in, on Saturday was a melting pot of every different type of person. It was truly inspiring. Let's take that very same question and go to Madeline Dean. Madeline, how do we uh, use Congress to end systemic racism? Well, thank you, Lorraine, for having me. Thank you, PCCY, for putting this terrific conversation together. Uh, I love listening and learning from this beautiful uh, panorama of smart young people uh, who are thinking and are challenging us uh, so that's, that's one way uh, that in Congress we change. We change by listening and learning and building relationships. I'm delighted to be here with Dwight Evans and Mary Gay Scanlon. It is a, a joy to serve in Congress with them. I had the privilege of serving with Dwight in the Pennsylvania House. So two of the things that I was going to say about how can we make a difference in Congress, uh, two concrete ways we do it, and uh, one of them is legislation. Uh, you know, when, when we all watched that horrendous video of the depraved actions of police officers murdering uh, an African-American man for nothing, absolutely for nothing, uh, in plain view with an indifference uh, and a depravity like I, I don't think we've seen. Uh, I felt despair. I felt despair for our country. Uh, but I have to tell you, uh, America is an optimistic place. And so what has happened in Congress, because of the, the breadth of protests and awakening of people of every color, uh, importantly, white people getting in this fight, is that uh, on Monday, we introduced a package, uh, the chair, Karen Bass of um, uh, Congressional Black Caucus put together a monumental package, Justice in Policing Act. Uh, and it has very concrete uh, things, tangible things that we should do in order to change how we deal with uh, policing, how policing deals with the public, and how policing deals uh, with the African American community specifically, in recognition of the systemic racism that has existed in this country for centuries. Uh, so in that legislation, we had a hearing on it on Wednesday, uh, we will ban the chokehold. Imagine that that man putting his knee on that on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds would be a legal maneuver? No, we have to ban the chokehold. We have to make lynching a federal crime. Imagine it's 2020 and we have failed to do that uh, after trying for almost a century to pass that legislation. 
It would also create a national registry of bad behavior by police officers. So that a police officer like the one in the incredibly tragic case of Tamir Rice, uh, a police officer in Cleveland who had been found unfit for service in another police department, simply moved across municipal lines, got a job, never told his unfitness for service, and killed a 12-year-old boy in a park. Uh, a national registry would tell us you can't skip jurisdictions, skip municipalities uh, with impunity. Uh, it would require body cameras uh, and car cameras. Um, there would be charging standards on when you could use court. It would ban the no-knock uh, entry into people's homes, uh, which resulted in the tragic death of Breonna Taylor. So there are legislative things we can do, and I think we are at an extraordinary moment of change, of civil rights uh, at this historic moment. So I'm pleased to serve with these congressional leaders to do that. But I want to flip quickly to the other side, because it's not just dealing with policing. Uh, it is dealing with how we spend our money. Uh, and so I'm thinking of, of, of uh, the former chairman of appropriations, Dwight Evans for Pennsylvania, who's chaired our appropriations uh, committee for many, many years. Uh, how we spend our money reveals our priorities. So in addition to modernizing and reimagining how the police should behave, we have to invest in our communities. We have to invest in education, making sure it is equitable. We have to invest in housing making sure it's available, humane, and, and safe, uh, and affordable. And we have to invest in jobs so that everybody has an equal shot at all of these opportunities. It all goes back to how we spend our dollars. Uh, those are two of the ways, whether through specific legislation, but also how we spend our money and reinvest in our communities equitably. Uh, those are some of the things that I'm, I'm encouraged, I believe, we will begin to do in Congress. Thanks for the question. That's great, Congresswoman Madeline Dean. And I see that Sharon Walsh from Curfield School is here. So, Sharon, I'm going to let you ask that question to Mary J. Scanlon, Congresswoman Mary J. Scanlon. So go ahead and ask the question that we've been discussing. Shannon, can you hear us? I see you. Okay. Shannon, are you there? Okay. Go ahead and ask the question. Can you hear me? Now I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we can. So what, what it was your question? Let's direct it to Congresswoman Mary okay. J. Scanlon. My question was, how are you able to end systemic racism in Congress? Okay. What, what are you doing to end it? Okay, thank you so much for the question and thank you for participating. Um, I think um, uh, Congresswoman Dean just provided the most immediate answer. She and I were down in DC earlier this week uh, for a hearing on the Justice in Policing Act and obviously that's front of mind with what happened, but it's systemic racism, right? That's, that's the issue. It's so ingrained in the fabric of our country that we all have a lot of work to do, whether it's in Congress or otherwise. You know, I saw in the chat room, um, as other people were asking questions, that there were questions about education funding, and, and one of the speakers mentioned the school to prison pipeline. Um, so we know we need to do a better job of investing in our education system so that people are getting the opportunity to get good jobs and, and um, you know, fulfill their potential um, as opposed to getting diverted into the prison pipeline, which has so damaged so many of our communities of color. Um, there have been books written about it in the Philly region. But I wanted to go back to, to something that Gabe said in his question. I mean, he said, you know, we've seen this video. How could someone do that? Why did this happen? And I think that really gets to what we're talking about right now. The fact that Gabe is saying, this is wrong. How on earth could some of something like this happen? You have to recognize that it's wrong. Um, and he sees that, and I'm pretty sure everyone on this call sees that. But the fact that there was a video of what happened to Mr. Floyd of his murder, has caused a whole section of this country to say, wait, how can this be happening? And to question it and say, we have to change things. So 
So just the, the recognition that it's wrong leading to the fact that we have to work and do something about it. So um, just to pick up a couple threads of what people have said before, uh, Evans talked about the fact that um, he was the first, um, he was the only and still is the only black person in the congressional delegation right now. Um, there had not been any women in our congressional delegation for several years, Bill Congresswoman Dean and two others and I were elected in 2018, just being willing to say, wait a minute, what is going on here? This doesn't look right. Why is this happening? And saying, oh, okay, not everyone in Congress has to be a white man. I could do that. And I know it was a leap for me to think about that because there have been so few examples today of women in Congress. Um, and then the third, third piece, really just going to what um, can young people do? And uh, I think uh, Congressman Evans talked about this being a generation historic, you know, in 50 years, we haven't seen this kind of activity since back of the days of protesting against the Vietnam War, demanding the right to vote for 18 year olds. So we are seeing that moment and it started with March for Our Lives, with high school students getting involved and demanding change and going out there and doing the hard work of organizing and registering voters and then getting people to vote. That activity brought people like Congresswoman Dean and myself to Congress for the first time. We have a gun safety authority for the first time in decades. And that's because young people got out there, spoke of the truth of what they were seeing, questioned why what was going on was wrong and then organized to do something about it. So I think we need to carry that through to this moment, to dismantling systemic racism, saying, no, it is not okay for a cop to kneel on a black man's neck and think he can get away with it, even with someone filming. That is just so outrageous. So um, your energy is important and, and channeling it towards organization and voting and having those hard conversations with people who are in power and then seizing power yourself. So I am so encouraged that we really are finally at a tipping point, a turning point here. And it's in large part due to folks who are on this call. Um, the next generation coming, pushing, saying, no, what we're seeing is not okay and it has to change. So thank you. All right. Sophia Lysenko from Abington Senior High School. I think our Congress members answered a lot of this question that, that you have, but do you have a follow-up question or do you want to dig deeper into what it is that we've already been discussing? Go ahead. Um, hello, thank you for allowing me to be on the call today. I was wondering um, specifically about a significant portion of advocacy has been on the topic of defunding the police and other methods of reform that we've been talking about today. Um, and there have been many recent pieces of legislation introduced. I was wondering how Congress is addressing this specifically um, towards the to this topic. Thank you. All right. Congressman Dwight Evans, why don't you take that one? I think that um, we are addressing it in a number of ways. You heard um, Congressman Mary Gay Scanner, who's vice chair of the Judiciary Committee, and Congresswoman Dean, who also is on that committee. I sit on the Small Business Committee. I'm vice chair of that committee. I sit on Ways and Means. And I think there's a direct connection between economic opportunity, education opportunity, healthcare opportunity, all those issues together. You know, I think un unfairly, if, if somebody who tries to be a police officer, that's an impossible job. Because the fact of the matter is we as policymakers need to do something about our education system, our healthcare system, uh, our economic system. And until we fundamentally in our various roles. Now, I like to believe that, uh, I feel very fortunate again. When I first came into Harrisburg, we was in a minority. And I'm, I'm not trying to just say political, but if you look at, as a result of the change, we're dealing with issues on gun violence as you heard Mary Gay Scandler talk about. We didn't deal with that wicked. We deal with, if you take the CARES Act, the CARES Act uh, is like $2.2 trillion invested in schools, transportation, airport, you name it. Uh, the HEROES Act, which we passed, which is over in the Senate. Uh, there are a number of things that we're attempting. There's a lot more things. The infrastructure needs to be dealt with. 
uh, things that we do. So in other words, there are issues that we're dealing with for the people, like voting. Voting is extremely essential, essential. In four months, you have a presidential election. The first time I voted, Mary Gay Scanlon and Madeline Dean, I was 18. <laughs> I voted for George McGovern in 1972. I have not missed an election since, I have not, since 1972, I've always voted. So the element of voting, the element of doing your census, the element of working in your neighborhood and your community is a combined effort. So yes, we can do what we do in Washington and pass laws, and Madeline Dean did a very good job of explaining that, but it's how we also interact and deal with each other. Neighbors, household, people in schools, it's that kind of a combination. What type of society do we want to be? What kind, we may have come over here on different boats, but we're all in the same boat now. And the reality of it is, all of you who are on this Zoom, young people especially, you know, where is the Madeline Deans, the Mary Gay Scanners, the Dwight Evans? You know, this is why I said what PCCY is doing is they linking up this intergeneration connection, which is something that is especially needed. I mean, we need each other. We need y'all for your energy, and you need us for to bring the thinking, to work together on this. So I'll share with you that right now in Congress is much more reflective of when I started out. I don't know what the number is. Either Madeline or Mary Gay can tell you how many women, the diversity of the women. I think there was a piece done in the New York Times, I think they can tell you about, never in history, 244 years old, Constitution, 244 years old. So yes, it has come a long way, but also I'm gonna say this last thing. It is good, but it's also good about thinking. Thinking is the most important aspect of it. And the aspect is the power is in the hands of the citizens. It's not in the hands of people who, who are Congress or senators. Citizens are most important. That's you. You hire, you make a, you're gonna make a determination about each one of us between here and November. I hope you pay attention to that. All right, let's go to uh, Congresswoman Madeline Dean. Well, I thank Sophia for her question. Uh, and I wanted to mention to Sophia and Veronica, I'm a proud Abington High School alum. So congratulations on your studies there. Uh, Sophia, to your question, uh, what I prefer to say is that we need to right fund our police departments. Uh, we need to make sure that we reimagine how our police departments are used. Uh, in our committee, uh, Representative Jackson Lee, who's been, Sheila Jackson Lee, has just been an extraordinary civil rights leader, uh, said we have to go away from police officers as warriors and back to what they should be, which is guardians. So I prefer the term um, right funding our police, reimagining the role that they should play in our communities. And, but as I said earlier, and I, I really wanna emphasize this, uh, that we have to refund communities equitably, um, adequately, if not excellently. Uh, when I was a state legislator, of course, we, had, we have a direct impact on education at the state level because so much of the funding for our public school system comes from uh, our state appropriations. Uh, we knew then, and we know now, that we do not adequately uh, support our school systems with the dollars that they should have, uh, and we never have equitably uh, offered um, the, the excellent education that our Constitution, our Pennsylvania Constitution, gives us the right to. It's not just a wish, it's the right. We, you have the right to uh, a thorough and efficient public school education. We have to live up to that uh, now as ever, because how we educate uh, young people will determine not only your future, but our own. Uh, so uh, I think it is about uh, where we put our dollars, whether it's in education, in mental health, in addiction services, decriminalizing, when you call, if someone, uh, God forbid, overdoses, and we know that happens very often, it shouldn't be police who are called. It should not be a criminal event. It is a public health uh, epidemic uh, when we have problems of overdose in our community. 
uh, when police are called into mental health situations. Again, not the right people to be calling. So we have to absolutely rethink how we handle communities and their needs, whether it's public health, mental health, addiction, um, children and youth, uh, all of those things. We, we can do this better. And I, I want to just say what gives me such hope. Look at us talking about this. Uh, people are saying the words systematic racism and actually recognizing it. Uh, it's not just some abstract thing. Sadly, George Floyd's life uh, it, it has been taken. Um, but I, maybe you saw at the funeral, his little daughter said, my daddy changed the world. I think her daddy did change the world because we're all talking about, about it. Whatever the color of our skin, whatever place we came from, whatever our religion, we're recognizing that in this country, we are struggling with uh, systemic racism. Uh, I think George Floyd is going to change the world. All right. Well, we have just a few more minutes before we get into a very juicy conversation about activism and what we can do to call out racism. But... Um, Congresswoman Mary J. Scanlon, would you like to uh, quickly respond to the question? Um, you know, I, it's hard to, to refine too much on what my colleagues have said already. They've covered a lot of ground. Um, we did talk about the fact that there are very concrete laws that we can implement, and that is at every level of government. So um, as we discussed in, in the opening, um, Congress is currently considering legislation, which we should be voting on by the end of the month. But Congress is going to pass it. Whether or not the Senate even takes it up is an open question. So we need the active young people, and we need them not to just call upon their allies. We need them to have hard conversations with people who are not yet persuaded. Um, that's what we're trying to do, and we need their help to do that because we need the overwhelming power of you know a society saying this is no longer okay. So I just uh, ask them to stay engaged. All right, that's great. Thank you so much. Now, I'm so excited for this section because we're going to be talking to student leaders who've led marches, called out racism, rallied students to vote, and let me introduce them. Kelly Minert from Central Bucks High School East, Paris Thompson, Springfield Township High School, Naya Jarbar, who is Laura Mar at Laura Marion High School, June Park from Chaverford High School. And we have this question uh, from ONP from Lenape Middle School. How can white kids in overwhelmingly white schools take action? So let's begin by uh, talking with Kelly Minert from Central Bucks High School East. Kelly? Hi, um, I actually, I go to Central Bucks East, which is in the same school district as Lenape. So I feel like I can probably provide some guidance in that area. Um, my school district is predominantly white but that doesn't mean that there isn't still work that you can do. Um, I think that the best thing to do is start having conversations with people close to you and calling out racism whenever you see it. Um, you know, our families, our friends, it can be a hard conversation to have, but if it's a hard conversation to have, it's probably the conversation worth having. Um, you know, in our area, you see things like, you know, kids on the school bus after sports games, you know, singing songs, singing songs that have the N-word in it and saying it without hesitating. And it can be a hard thing to do, but when you're in those situations, the best thing to do is to stand up and say, that's not right, you need to stop. And, you know, educating your peers. And it can be a hard thing to do. I've had to speak out against some of my closest friends and you know it was very hard I had to unfortunately you know sever some friendships that were harmful because of their inability to listen and learn about why racism is a problem in this country and why their actions are harmful and you know it you know you see protests and if you can go to a protest I think you should and you can post educational content on your Instagram, but I think that the real activism starts in your home, at your school, with your friends, and I think that that's the best place where we can actually get some things done and help to change racism directly when you see it. I love that. Kelly, thank you for standing up and calling out racism as you see it. Let's go to Paris Thompson from Springfield Township High School. Paris? 
Hi. Um, so to answer that question, I go to Spring Potash High School, so it's a largely white school. Um, some of the things that I did was I like made a template email to write our county commissioners um, and ask them to like, you know, make a statement and, you know, represent our township as one that supports its black members. And um, a lot of the people that did the template email were white, actually, and they were from my school. And it kind of surprised me because um, generally people don't really speak out against racism at our school. And so when I like asked the people why they wanted to write these emails, they said that they were just, you know, they they were really inspired by everything and they wanted to change and they wanted to like be a part of that change. So I've heard so many people come to me and they're like, um, like, what can I do to help? And I think that's just like a really big thing that you can do is just, you know, social media has been really good in like giving you information on how you can help in any way instead of being just on the front lines. So I would suggest doing that and things as such. Also, um, I just wanted to add this in there. I'm, I was researching my um, township police department and they don't, I realized that Pennsylvania doesn't reveal the disciplinary records on the police officers. And I feel like I'd be a lot more comfortable in my township or just in general, if things like this were released. So thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Paris. Naya Jarba from Laura Marion High School, go ahead. Hi, my name is Naya Jarba. I'm a recently graduated senior from Laura Marion High School. Last Sunday, myself and a few students from Laura Marion ran a very peaceful protest. The protest was dedicated to honoring George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, among the many others that have been victims of racial injustice. And we decided to give students of color the chance to finally share their voices and experiences as students at Laura Marion, because a lot of the time students of color's voices here get downplayed or our voices get silenced. So we decided to invite the superintendent, all school board members, principals, teachers, students, and other as many community members as possible so our voices could really be heard. Uh, the protests ran extremely well with around 1,500 attendees. We also made sure that included a registration booth so we could actually enforce the changes that we wanted to be made. Um, we, address, we address the racism and ignorance within our school, the three-day suspension given to the students who have said these racist remarks during the time, and the lack of black and brown teachers. Now I'm working with the school board and the superintendent to make sure that these changes are actually made. Mm -hmm. And so my, student, my siblings who are future um, students of Lower Mary could actually have their voices heard and can be comfortable in the district. Wow, thank you so much for your activism. June Park from Haverford High School. What's Hi, your I'm June from Haverford High School. Um, similarly, last Sunday, a group of you know, Haverford High students, including myself, were very frustrated, I think, with seeing the constant murder of you know, our Black community um, by police brutality. And so we actually waited for some of the adults to move to organize something, but nothing really happened. And so we decided to take matters in our own hands, and we organized the Havertown Stands with Black Lives Matter March. So we organized everything from getting the permit for the protest, creating infographics, and actually even leading the march last Sunday. Um, we had over, you know, Havertown is a predominantly white suburban neighborhood, but even that, um, we had, I think, around 2,000 people, including actually Congresswoman Scanlon, um, come out and chant and march with us in solidarity for Black Lives Matter. Um, at the protest, we collectively kneeled um, as we heard the list of names of the victims of police brutality. Um, we also even registered people to vote. Um, and at the end, um, we read our list of required actions regarding racial justice in our township, including um, hiring a diversity coordinator in our school district, um, because we recognize that this march that you know, we organize is only the beginning um, of a movement of racial justice in our communities. And so what I urge kind of the young people to do is to first um, educate yourself and you know, the people around you. Second, demand specific change um, in your community, even if that makes the adults uncomfortable. Um, and so when no one else is doing it, step up. And last but definitely not the least, something I'm quite um, very passionate about, please register to vote um, and vote in November and in every election afterwards that you can um, for diverse candidates um, because representation does really, really matter. Thank you.
You know, actually, I have a question for, for all of our panelists, because uh, you all stepped out, you all have shown courage and uh, extraordinary activism in what you do. There's sometimes a cost to that. Uh, you all, often don't have the agreement of the people around you. Kelly, you talked about how you had to cut some folks out. And I don't doubt that some of you might have experienced some blowback through social media. So I'm wondering if each of you can talk about how you cope with, with the difficulties of what you're doing, because there is a challenge. It's what you're doing is, is strong and brave, and it's tough, too. And I wonder if you can share your thoughts for other young people like yourselves who might be a little more timid about taking a stand because they're worried about the consequences. Because as a teen, you like to fit in. That's kind of the nature of that time in your life. Kelly, you start. Yeah, so I mean, my sophomore year of high school, I had to speak out against racism that I was seeing on my soccer team. And as a result, like my soccer team essentially like started to shun me. They told me that they did not agree with my stance that Black Lives Matter. And it was difficult. I had to make an entire new friend group. Um, and it was hard, but ultimately I had the support of my school. My school stepped in and tried to educate the soccer team on why their actions were wrong. Um, but it was hard, but I got through it because I knew that I was doing the right thing. I knew that people would look back and regret the way that they had acted. And I knew that I was taking a stand for what mattered. And, um, ultimately I look back and I have no regrets for how I acted and what I said. And that is what has helped me get through any hard time because I know that I mean, I can look back and be happy, and hopefully they're able to look back and grow from that experience, and hopefully today they can be on a different side. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Paris, what about you? Um, I would say the same things as Kelly. You know, I think it's really worth, you know, standing up for what you believe in, because the character growth that comes out of that is going to be so much more important than not speaking out, so... Same thing as Kelly, just try it. You'll, it'll be so worth it afterwards and you'll feel really proud of yourself and hopefully other people will grow around you. Other people will grow around you. I love that. What about you, Naya? Um, a lot of my peers know I'm usually outspoken when it comes to certain things, especially if it includes people of color. So I, I, in my town, I had a huge support system a lot of people reached out to me and asked me if there was anything they could do to help. But I think I did have to at least reach out to a few friends that were silent or had different views just to educate them and just to let them know if you call me your friend, you have to at least believe that my life matters just as much as yours. And I think it is a really difficult conversation to have, but it's one that has been pushed under the rug or shoved under the rug and it's 2020 and I think a lot of people are fed up so I think the reason why this uproar is happening is because people the people are ready to speak out and I really do pride all of you guys for listening to us and using your voice yeah we have reached a tipping point I think June Park what about you yeah so um I, someone said this quote to me at one point. They were like, you know, I didn't get into, I didn't get involved in politics. Um, politics involved me. I think the reality for a lot of, uh, you know, minorities in this country is that oftentimes we don't get to choose whether or not, you know, we, you know, that we are involved in politics. The reality is that our lives, you know, especially recently with police brutality in the black community, is that you know we face these kind of struggles. So I really strongly urge, you know, you know students to become allies um you know use your voice so i saw someone saying you know please vote for me um you know please you know vote in for you know pro-racial justice candidates you know please vote for people that you know that will make a difference so again i guess my main thing is is if you are a little bit on the more quiet side please um step up and make a difference and um and one last thing please 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 vote in november and every election afterwards love that june you all 
Kelly, Paris, Naya, and June are warriors. I, I think as adults, um, we sometimes forget that we can learn from you. And I think we have learned so much from just being in your presence today. So inspired by you today. And so speaking of inspiring, I'm going to bring back Dr. Tawana Jones-Morrison. She has some words of encouragement. Dr. Morrison. Thank you. Wow. I am also extremely inspired by the stories and the work that the youth have been doing um, for them even being brave enough to come today. So I just want to thank them all today for showing up. We have really processed a lot and I'm excited. Um, I'm celebrating you all. And it's important that I acknowledge also your bravery. Your voices are so important. It is not easy to raise your voice like so many of you have said, and particularly in a time when so many people have become silent. Um, it's not easy to start the hard conversations, to think differently than your parents and your friends sometimes, and to organize, but you all are really doing it. And I hear your courage, and it's inspiring. Um, some adults might not tell you this, but we are learning from you. You are leading the way. You've identified the issues and acted on them. And I encourage you to keep pushing, keep talking, keep marching toward the world that you want to live in. And on your journey, there will be ups and downs. So take lots of selfies and make TikTok videos and Instagram stories because you're going to want to remember these moments. And if you get stuck, I want you to remember that you have supporters who are out there supporting you, that you can lean on, and there are trusted adults who will be here to help you find your way. Because the change that you are creating is the path for those who come behind you, your siblings and the, the graduating class that's coming up behind you, even your friends. Um, and if you're preparing for college, you have really checked off a lot of boxes, learning from obstacles, challenging beliefs, solving problems. But I want you to remember that these experiences don't just get you into college. They actually change the world. So when you tell your story, and people are going to ask you, when you tell your story, tell them that you are an advocate, that you are an activist, an organizer who asks the hard questions and makes the hard choices to stand up for what is right, to stand up for humanity, and to reimagine the world. It has really been my pleasure to, to share space with you today, to learn from you all, to listen to you all. And it looks like the world is ready for you. So keep raising your voices, keep creating the movements and working at making yourselves and your communities what you want them to be. So inspired by all of your stories, your questions and all of the work that you were doing. Thank you so much for what, for what you have and what's to come. Dr. Joanna Jones Morrison, thank you so much for those inspiring words. And we are inspired and we are so grateful that Public Citizens for Children and Youth provided this space for us to have this conversation with these amazing young people, these leaders who are truly making a change for the future generations and also the adult allies who are here joining and sharing this space together with us. So with some closing remarks and a call for action for PCCY, we have Tamia Scipio-Smith. Okay. Thank you, Lorraine. And thank you all so much for joining us this, uh, this morning to have this very uh, difficult discussion, ask your questions, share your stories, and engage in this very difficult dialogue. So why are we here today? Um, we are here because people are speaking out and finally saying that Black Lives Matter, that our lives matter in the context of us living in the United States of America and in the country. So before Joy, George Floyd's death, we heard that rallying cry, and many of us have wondered why, why it wasn't taken seriously until now. Well, on July 4th, 1776, America declared its independence and proclaimed these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those were supposed to be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet, in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the United States Constitution, adopted in 1787, voted upon at the Constitutional Convention, slaves, or Black people, were counted as three-fifths of a person, 
to determine the state's total population for legislative representation and for taxing purposes. Back then, black lives clearly didn't matter. And when slavery was abolished after the Civil War with the Emancipation Proclamation and black people weren't told about it, black lives didn't matter then either. And when the laws were written and adopted to deny black people the right to vote, to own property, learn to read, attend school, have separate water fountains, or live where they wanted to live, the message was loud and clear. Black people didn't matter. And when the laws passed to change all of that, yet today, people are still being persecuted when they try to vote, own property, learn to read, attend school, have inequitably funded schools, and cannot live where they want to live, and worse yet, don't have the ability to breathe, we still find it hard to believe that Black lives now, in fact, do matter. Obviously, we as a country have a lot of work to do. When someone cannot go bird watching because he can, he's being persecuted, or when you have to have a conversation with your 11, almost 12-year-old son that he cannot have a Nerf gun unless it's white or yellow or pink or red, because if he uses a black one, he's going to be shot within two seconds, then there's a problem. If you can have a conversation in Harrisburg with legislators and have a law degree and uh, go there and not be acknowledged unless someone talks to you about how they're helping the black people, well, then there's a problem. Um, and that's a privilege. Like, if you don't have to live with that, that's a privilege. Um, and so the reason why we're having this conversation today is because it's unacceptable. And as you've heard from all of the people that are on this call today, all of these young people, um, they have gotten into the fight, they're willing to step up, and they're going to make a change. It's about time that we're at this place. It's the beginning of many conversations. But when the law doesn't do what it's supposed to do and support people equitably and honestly and justly and assume that all lives do in fact matter and treat people as such, well, then it's time to take action. So here we are today and obviously we acknowledge that we as a country have a lot of work to do. So let this not be the end of a teen town hall. Let this be the start of many more conversations yet to come. We want you to stay engaged, and one way that you can do that is to get involved with PCCY as we continue to fight for equitable school funding. As we continue to uh, fight for access to high quality education from birth through 12th grade. And let us keep fighting to ensure that all children have health care. If you want to join, go to PCCY.org and join the work. Thank you for being a part of this very difficult conversation and for joining us today. Two, three, four.
Thank you again for joining us uh, this, this day. Um, please continue to keep fighting, keep marching, keep working so that we don't have this conversation again about not being able to breathe. Keep going. <laughs>